You're listening to episode 23 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here, we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costello here today with mobile home park and manufactured housing investor Brad Johnson. Brad is co-founder of Park Street Partners and founder of Evergreen Capital. He's also the co-host of the Mobile Home Park Investors Podcast with Jefferson Lilly. Today, we're going to talk to Brad about the tax benefits of mobile home park investing, his new fund, Evergreen Capital, and how he handles accounting and taxes. But before we do, I want to remind you to check out our knowledge base by navigating to therealestatecpa.com as it help you find answers to your tax questions. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our new white paper, A Real Estate Investor's Guide to Opportunity Funds. Brad, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Could you give our audience a little information on your background and how you got started in real estate? Yeah, sure. So I started out not in real estate at all. I was actually in the shipping industry. I had a startup in my mid-20s with a couple of partners. And you know the company was doing well. It started kicking off you know, some cash flow. And uh, we, we didn't really know what to do with the money. We were young. We were kind of dumb. We had no idea what we were doing. So instead of reinvesting the, the cash flow back into the company, we thought we'd uh, diversify into some real estate. And so we bought some you know, duplexes, some single family homes, and you know, I ended up catching the bug. It was supposed to be a side project just, just to diversify, and I ended up becoming very passionate about it and wanted to go into it deeper. So I, I left that partnership, sold my interest, and moved to San Francisco with my wife and Weaseled my way into an analyst job at a real estate private equity company. Then from there, I you know bounced around to a couple of different other real estate firms. Uh, during the downturn, went back to school, got my MBA, uh, and then uh, ended up with East Old Secured, which is Wells Fargo's real estate investment bank. After that, uh, and then had my first child. Was working insane hours, Wall Street hours. Had my first child, and and decided that that was a good catalyst to. To actually split off and uh, and do my own venture because I was tired of working insane hours and not seeing my family. Uh, so now I work insane hours, uh, you know, for my own business, and at least I can pass on a, a company and a cash flow machine, hopefully, to to my kids. Awesome, awesome. So how was it? So like when you made the transition between to corporate to to being an entrepreneur, why why did you go? You know, why did you go into mobile home parks? What was the draw with, with mobile homes? Yeah, well, I always had mobile home parks in the back of my mind. It's not a, you know, it's not a, an asset class that most people think of. It's an asset class that is really misunderstood. And I had met a guy, I don't know, I want to say 15 years ago, who was doing very well in mobile home parks, flying under the radar. And you know, the more I kind of just learned about them, the more I loved. And you know, I was really looking for an asset class that was uh, that wasn't going to be incredibly competitive, right? And when you work for an investment bank, you see, you know, a large transaction can have sometimes 20, 30 people bidding on it. It's a very efficient market. It's hard to find a great deal, right? There's more market timing that goes into it, right? If you want to find an inefficient asset class, you got to find something that is not beloved by everybody. So you got to find things that are misunderstood. And mobile home parks certainly fit that bill, right? There's not uh, a ton of people that are going after them. Most people have a negative connotation when they think about it. When in reality, they're just hardworking people that need an affordable place to stay. And uh, these properties are actually quite nice, at least the ones that we target. Absolutely. And, and another good thing, you know, from, from my understanding about mobile home parks are because it is affordable housing, they will fare well in a recession. Yeah, that was a big thing for me. I'm very... Uh, I'm risk averse, which is kind of counterintuitive. You go off and start your own firm and you're, you know, you're getting debt on these properties. But if you look at an asset class like mobile home parks or any asset class that, that has reliable cash flows, even in recessions, then that, to me, that is not exactly a risky asset, right? So for mobile home parks, the great thing about them is that, you know, they are just amazing businesses, right? You, you, you can look at 
the public companies in the space, equity lifestyle, properties, some communities. And if you look at the last 20 years of income, they've never had a negative year of a net operating income. It's always been positive. They just compound it, you know, 3% a year in terms of rental growth, which is unreal in the face of the largest credit crisis we've ever seen. And of course, the recession we had in 2000, 2001. So through both those cycles, mobile home parks have actually done quite well. And there's a couple of reasons to that. Part of that is, is the fact that, you know, there's no new supply. Nobody's building any more of these things. And then you have amazing demographic tailwinds, right? Everybody needs affordable housing in this country. It's actually an epidemic. So that's unique, you know, that's a unique equation. You have a declining supply and increasing demand. There's not that many businesses that have that, that structure to them. So you, you mentioned that nobody's building these anymore. Um, what makes you say that? And could somebody go and build these? Or is, is it just not feasible? What's, what's going on there? Most of it is this concept of not in my backyard, right? So when somebody proposes to build a mobile home park in a county, they, they tend to have to go get it entitled, right? There's not just a lot of undeveloped land that's currently entitled for mobile home parks. So they have to get it entitled. And to do that, they have to submit it to the, the city hall, the building department, and get it approved. And generally, there's a voting period that the you know, people in the city can come and, and vote for or against it. So most people, because they don't understand mobile home parks, think that if they build one in the community, that's going to tank property values. So they say, no, we don't want them in. Then also, you have you know, these cities that would prefer to have land developed into an apartment unit or building a industrial building, a retail you know, mall, because it's going to generate more taxable property taxes than a mobile home park would per square foot. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So I know that mobile home parks, manufactured housing come with a lot of tax benefits. Can you describe some of those? Yeah, sure. It's, it's actually counterintuitive because if you think about it, what are you really owning as a mobile home park buyer? You own the land, right? And land you can't depreciate. But the reality is, is that most of the value of all these mobile home parks is in the land infrastructure. So that's the, the roads, the, the water pipes, the, the driveways, and, and also uh, the value is also in the goodwill of that property, right? Just the ability to have that property operate as a mobile home park. You can think of that as the permit for the property. There's goodwill that you can appreciate at 15 years. And then that land infrastructure, you can depreciate at 15 years. So in comparison to apartment buildings, which are 27 and a half, and commercial buildings, which are 39 years, right? That is accelerated depreciation. You can't do that on 100% of the purchase price, of course, right? You got to take off that 20% or whatever, whatever it is for the land component, just the raw land, not the improved land. But still, you have 70, 80% of the property that it's going to be, by and large, depreciable at around 15 years. Absolutely. And are you running cost segregation studies to break these components out? We don't do a, a cost seg uh, per se where you have somebody fly out and, and go through every inch of the property that you would for, say, a large commercial property. But we do have an appraisal firm do a, a desktop cost seg where they look at the land value. We get comps on the land and they look at the value of the infrastructure. They measure out the streets and apply you know, a uh, per square foot price for the, the roads, the pipes, et cetera. So it, in essence, it's like a cost seg study, but we, we kind of created it on our end because there's really not a market for mobile home park cost segregations. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Desktop cost segregation studies are pretty prominent. Uh, we, we, we refer to. Oh, few, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we, it's done a lot in, in multifamily too. I can definitely see mobile home, they're not being a market for cost seg. I mean, everybody's in multifamily right now. So all the cost seg guys are targeting multifamily, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No reason to do anything else at this point. Um, but that, that's really cool. So, so knowing the 2018 tax changes with the 100% bonus depreciation on any component of your property with a useful life of less than 20 years, um, that means that you can depreciate or immediately expense via the via 100% bonus depreciation, you can immediately expense all of these land improvements that are allocated during this, during this acquisition price and that are prominent in the mobile home, the manufactured housing space. How has that potential to reap the tax benefits changed your buying strategy or has it at all? 
It hasn't at all just yet. And to be honest, we haven't gone deep on the tax analysis for 2018 as it relates to the park depreciation. I suspect that we won't get overly aggressive with it just because you know we're, we're long-term holders anyway and like to spread out the benefits over multiple years. Uh, but it's certainly something that we're going to investigate for. Good stuff. And are any of your investors asking about 100% bonus depreciation at this point? Not yet, surprisingly. I, you know, I imagine that uh, what we could do is probably depreciate some of the homes that we do end up buying. We do end up owning about 5% of our total lots, uh, the homes on those lots, which you know, we have about 2,000 units or pads rather. So I can imagine that you know, if we're outlaying $50,000 for a new home, that maybe we, we take a look at that depreciation, the bonus depreciation there. So when you have these businesses and you, you know, your operations are going, do you end up, how do you guys end up handling the bookkeeping for, for in the accounting side of the business? Do you do it yourself or how does that work for you? Oh God, no. Uh, I started doing it myself when we bought our first couple of properties and, you know, that was just out of necessity. We didn't have a, a team yet, right? We were just getting ranked up. But as soon as we could possibly justify it, we hired uh, we hired bookkeepers just because it's not a great use of, of my time as an acquisition professional. The best use of my time is, is, is looking for new deals, growing the company. Whereas, uh, you know, somebody who is very skilled at accounting knows it well, can do it in probably five times the amount of time that I can. Uh, we were looking for those people to hire almost right out of the gate. It definitely recommended that most people, especially if you're going to be doing big deals, not to do your own bookkeeping. It just slows you down. And if you're not, you're not a professional, um, you know, a professional accountant that is, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to do on a consistent basis and definitely something you want to get out of the way. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for, you know, understanding it and kind of being involved. You know, I, that's the nice thing about the fact that I did start doing it for the company is that I feel like I'm better equipped to actually talk to our CPA come tax season and I catch more things, right, in our books and our taxes because it was, you know, something that I was dealing with in the weeds day one. Because what you don't want to be is the equivalent of me when I go to the auto body shop and the guy tells me that uh, whatever the crank is busted and we got to spend $1,000, I have no idea what he's talking about. So I just nod my head and pay the man. So with taxes, I feel like at least if you have some sort of baseline understanding of, of the accounting, of the bookkeeping, then you're going to be better equipped to save on taxes every year. But Brad, we love the people that don't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, just, you're telling people to scrutinize everything? Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, but you love the people just that. Here's the, the tax bill. Just sign and send it back. <laughs> That's good. Um, re- real quick question. I know Thomas has another one for you. Was there a certain point where you were like, I'm definitely offloading the bookkeeping now? Or was it just always, I'm never doing this. I'm just going to offload it, give it, give it to somebody else and let them deal with it. Yeah. So when you're managing other people's money, you have to be you know, laser focused on, on overhead, especially in real estate in the beginning. And so we were looking to get a certain amount of properties. It was really, I think we, we waited until we had seven or eight properties before we completely offloaded our accounting you know, first, I think after the third property, we hired a temporary bookkeeper and then I oversaw that person, right? And then by the seventh property, we hired a full-time bookkeeper. And then by the, you know, the 15th property, we hired a controller to oversee the bookkeeper, right? And so it's just kind of progressed. And now at the 22nd property, we have an accounts payable person, accounts receivable person, the, the controller, right? And then all this, uh, obviously our CPAs that do the fund level accounting. So, you know, you, you got to do it incrementally if you're running a real estate company. You don't want to just go out and hire, you know, two $100,000 plus accountants day one. You got to get there organically. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. As your business scales, you have to scale the rest of your operations as well. You can't just dive in 100% on day one. But one of the questions that I was specifically interested in hearing about, I'm sure our audience is interested in hearing about as well, is... You have Park Street Partners, which is a traditional fund, and then you have Evergreen Capital, which is your new venture. And I understand that they differ in the way investors invest in each. Uh, Would you be able to go a little bit into their different structures and the tax benefits of each? Yeah, so Park Street Partners raised money kind of conventionally uh, for funds, right? We we would do an LLC that would own a bunch of properties and the investors would get taxed as partners, right? In that asset. 
And so they would get a K-1 every year and they would pay their pro rata share of the net income, uh, which is great, but that's, you know, it's a, it's a really a five to 10 year type of fund. It's, it's probably going to be around 10 years before we, we think about uh, having to sell everything. We might, we might sell it sooner, but we have 10 years. And the more I focused and thought about this industry, the more I thought, well, you know, I think that actually that's not the most efficient model to invest in just about anything. I think the most efficient model is to create essentially a holding company that is not going to be a partnership. It is, you know, it's taxed as a corporation, but it can be set up as an evergreen type of corporation that compounds capital over a very long term. So you don't, you don't have to think about, you know, when are we buying and selling these things? Like how long are we holding them? You know, when is the best opportunity to refinance and push leverage so we can maximize returns? You know, what cycle are we selling into or buying into? Right? If you can remove all of that and just focus on compounding capital sustainably right, while mitigating risk, then you can focus on the stuff that's important, which is allocating capital to the most attractive investment opportunities. And the other stuff kind of falls at the wayside. So that's the vision for Evergreen. Evergreen is launching you know, next month. And it's, you know, it's just like the name says, it's an Evergreen fund. Right? It's open-ended, long-term. The concept is similar to like what Berkshire Hathaway would be, where you're just trying to compound capital at a, you know, a, a double-digit IRR over the long term, as opposed to thinking about flipping you know, investments over a five, even a 10-year whole period. So evergreen capital, it's like a play on the word too. Like it's legitimately evergreen. Yeah, I mean, most people, you know, don't really have experience with evergreen funds. Uh, they're pretty rare, but yeah, exactly. It is, it's, it's, the name is, is not clever in that, in that sense. It's exactly what we are. I don't know. I, I would say it's pretty clever. I mean, we're the real estate CPA, right? And that's exactly no, what we are. Go. People yeah. say it's clever all the time. <laughs> yeah, keep it simple, stupid, right? I mean, right, it's exactly. It's quite complicated. There's no need. Just tell people yeah. what you're getting. I love it. <laughs> Very good. So you told us that your investors receive a 1099 div, which is a tax form uh, that you typically get when you invest in equities that issue dividends. So if I was investing in Apple stock, I would get a 1099 div for all the dividends that Apple's given me throughout the year. When investors typically invest in these funds, they usually receive K-1s because they actually take a stake in the entity rather than a 1099 div. So Explain how that works and how that type of reporting might benefit investors. Yeah, so most, my experience is that most retail investors are not really in love with getting a bunch of K-1s every year. You know, the, you get a K-1 and often it comes, you know, late in the tax season. And if it's in a diversified fund or you have, you know, say five or 10 of these different holdings, right? So you're getting five or 10 different K-1s from all these different firms. You know, they're coming at varying times, and many of them, if they're diversified, have multiple states in them. So all of a sudden, you're a retail investor who's only invested in stocks and bonds. You go to make your first private asset investment in real estate. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're getting 10 different K-1s, a bunch of different states, and they're coming, you know, in March, April, May, June, right? And you're not used to extending. So... That has caused a lot of grief with some of our investors just getting used to that, right? The private world um, cadence of, of taxes. So with, with this, you know, you're going to get a, it's a, it's a C-Corp. It's taxed as a C-Corp. So you're getting a 1099 dividend every year in February, most likely. That will just be, you know, use the distributions that were made out of the, out of the corporation to you. And the nice thing about it is that, you know, this wouldn't have been, real practical before the tax reform bill that was just recently passed, right? But now that the corporate taxes have been reduced to around the 20% rate, then the corporate entity can take care of most of that tax headache, right? For all the investors. And so if you're getting K-1s for a bunch of different LLCs that the, the corporation is invested into, it can consolidate that tax return and pay any taxes on behalf of all the retail investors. And then it can make dividends from there. Or even better, it can reinvest the capital tax efficiently into more assets and then thus compound uh, returns in a tax efficient manner. Awesome. Awesome. There's definitely something to be said about simplifying 
as best you can. And uh, I think that you're probably the first person I've heard of that simplifies in that manner. It's very cool, very, very well thought out. You know, investors are not the only people that hate tons of K1s. I can attest that CPAs also hate <laughs> when they're <laughs> tons of K1s. There's a lot to sift through. <laughs> not, they can be a bummer. Excellent. Excellent. Well, tell us in 30 seconds or less, what is your favorite piece of technology that you're using these days? Ooh, well, we use uh, Google Earth a lot, which you know isn't like this complicated tech, but I mean, it is nice to be able to look at a property and aerial and zoom in with, from your computer, from your office uh, versus having to fly out there uh, to get into the weeds. And so there's been plenty of deals where you know, they look pretty good. And then all of a sudden you look at Google Earth and realize, oh, wait a minute, it's next to some landfill, right? We're not going to buy that thing. So oftentimes the broker doesn't put those pictures in the package, right? When they send of them course not. Or the seller doesn't mention it when they're on the phone with them. So Google Earth is probably my favorite. And second after that is probably, this is another basic one, but our check scanning software that we have on all these properties is amazing because it, it scans the rent checks, which hits our bank account immediately. And then hits our accounting software. So I thought you guys would appreciate that. Uh, and automatically updates everything real time as opposed to having to do double and triple entry. Nice, nice. So is there any advice you'd want to share with our listeners on what they should look for when investing in mobile home parks, you know, either as a as a limited partner or you know, even as an active investor? Ooh, yeah. So I mean, I can spend an hour doing that, but I would say, you know. Mostly, you're looking for you know, properties that are in reasonable size markets. Yeah, let's talk about where you can get in trouble. So you don't want to buy a park in a you know a one horse town that has one employer that employs the whole town. Or you want a reasonable size metro area. I don't know, call it a hundred thousand MSA at least. You want to have housing prices above a hundred thousand uh, because then it's a, a nice delta from that fifty thousand single wide uh, new home, right? So that's affordable housing. You want uh, reasonable incomes, so, you know, 40,000 median income or above. And then you don't want, on the risk side, you don't want private utilities, right? Unless you are a big operator and have a ton of money to put to work and can buy a bunch of these things and spread around the risk, then you don't want to buy one with uh, private utilities because, you know, you buy a, maybe a property that costs $2 million and the, the private utilities go out, which is, you know, could be a well or a treatment plant, right? And one of those goes out and it could end up costing you, you know, half of your investment. It could be a 500000 it could be a million dollar, you know, bill to fix, which obviously is not practical. So that's what I would say is this focus kind of on doing, you know, basic deals first in, in reasonable size mar- uh, markets. And just think about the downside because the upside and the math takes care of itself. Yeah, that's what, that's what I always hear. I heard that statement a few times, uh, protect the downside, the upside take care of itself. Well, if our listeners wanted to get in contact with you uh, to learn more about kind of what you have going on, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can just simply visit evergreencap.com. That's evergreencap.com. And they can find out more about uh, Evergreen and, and myself. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Brad, we definitely appreciate you hopping on and, and talking about uh, mobile home parks for us and our audience. Any final words before we head out today? I would just say that, uh, you know, I think that most people tend to focus on trying to maximize a return and, and have a tendency to think short term. And I would just encourage you know, people that, you know, the best things in life, you know, relationships, education, your health, careers, and even financial returns are they're all due to the benefits of compounding. So, you know, focus on the long term and, and try to find investors or investments that, uh, that you can live with for a long time sustainably and uh, stop, you know, trying to take shortcuts to get to your ultimate goal. Yeah, no, I definitely, definitely agree with what you just said there. If anybody out there listening, if you're going to be investing in real estate or investing in anything, definitely want to have a long-term perspective on things. Definitely don't want to take the short, short-term view because that's where you're going to get into a lot of trouble. So thanks again, Brad, for coming on today and um, see you around. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. 
to become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.